So, so thank you so much to Piyush for the invitation. Uh, he asked me to present to prepare a set of slides, and I, and I did that. But my my intention, my hope is that we can spend the majority of the time on sort of open ended Q and A. Uh, I, I I I really like interacting with my audience, and so I'm going to try to um, give the presentation about fifteen to twenty minutes, so that we have have the majority of the time for questions. Yes. So the kind. The, the kinds of topics we're going to be talking about today, I'm going to give you a little bit about my background so you have context uh, about uh, my career so far and uh, you know the experience that I have related to uh, P interview. I'm going to give you an, an analogy with the NBA, a basketball analogy. Then I'm going to share with you how to prepare for product manager interviews in 15 to 20 hours. I'll share a few of the common pitfall, pit, pitfalls that I've heard uh, from uh, other candidates. And I'll share a few resources that I think are, are useful to, um, to investigate uh, and, and read more about. And then, and then finally, we'll do the, the Q&A, which is where I hope to spend the majority of the time. So with that in mind, let me tell you a bit about myself. Uh, I'm originally from Caracas, Venezuela. That's where I was born. And uh, I was raised there. I lived there, uh, the exception of a couple of uh, you know, one-year stints abroad. I lived there for, for the majority of my life until I turned 18. And then when I graduated from high school, I went. I moved to the United States where I started going to school at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. I studied mathematics and computer science there and, uh, and, and decided that I wanted to pursue technology as sort of my, one of my passions right after graduation. So I joined Google as an associate product manager uh, back in 2007. And I spent about five and a half years at Google working primarily in consumer-facing products, including web search, Google Maps, speech recognition, uh, Android. Um, and then after a, a while, uh, uh, Marissa Meyer uh, was asked to lead Yahoo as their CEO in July of 2012. Um, and uh, she had init initially recruited me at Google as part of the APM program. And, uh, and I saw an opportunity to try to bring Yahoo back to greatness uh, and uh, relaunch the company, relaunch some of the products that joined Yahoo uh, in October. Uh, I spent three years there primarily working on, on mobile products, such as Yahoo Homepage as a native app, and then also on Yahoo Mail, which is Yahoo's largest mobile app. Um, I had it on there. Uh, it was exciting times. It was very tough to. Uh, try to turn around, um, big ship, um, you know, type of thing. It was still a really fun challenge, and uh, I had some memorable times there uh, with the leadership and and the very talented people that were part of the Yahoo teams um, at, during those times. Uh, and then I was kind of uh, feeling a little bit entrepreneurial and decided to try my luck at uh, a, at a couple of different projects. The first one was. Uh, is called La Tienda Venezolana, and that's a. It's literally in span. It's Spanish for the Venezuelan store. It, it's uh, it's an online store. We sell physical goods to Venezuelan expats in the U.S. Uh, and we've, I've been operating that for a little bit over two years. Uh, and the other thing that I've been spending my time on is on product management coaching, and that's kind of like the the final square there uh, with my initials. Uh, and I've done coaching for individuals as well as for businesses. Uh, and uh, you know, if you have any questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to, to provide more context. But it's also been a fun ride trying to, to bring, bring together some of the lessons I learned in Silicon Valley and how they apply to aspiring product managers and also to startups and medium-sized companies that want to learn uh, from, from kind of tech culture. Uh, in my career, I've interviewed by now over 400 product managers and at Yahoo as part of the hiring committee for over two years. And that's a committee that makes the final hiring decisions uh, or final hiring recommendations to the CEO um, for, and in this case at Yahoo, it was for all product managers, program managers, project managers, and designers. Um, so that was a fun way to see uh, in the entire company how different uh, folks interview candidates. What kinds of questions they ask? How how they you know how are they judged? And that gave me a way of calibrating myself um, to see you know get a good sense of uh, what different people look for when they are talking to aspiring PMs. 
And then finally, in the last uh, two years, two and a half years or so, I've been I've coached over fifty aspiring PMs. Um, so so there's been a lot of lessons learned from them. And one of the one of the the things I I started noticing when I talked to to very successful uh, PMs and who wanted to change uh, careers or change companies uh, is is I noticed something that 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 sounded similar to to something I observed in the NBA. So the the NBA has a uh, you know for those who don't follow sports very closely, it has this thing called a slam dunk contest. Um, and they host it every year, and it started in 1984. So since the beginning, they've had, uh, oh, the other thing that's important to mention is people go and, and slam dunk, and there's five judges that give points to, to the different dunks. And so it's like judged by, by five people. There was a period of time, I think around six years, between 2008 and 2013 or 2014, where they allowed people to do uh, voting via text message, but then they got rid of that. So now it's just a panel of five judges. And since the beginning of the competition, there's been 33 slam dunk champions. Now, out of those 33, only three have actually won an NBA championship, right? Like they've been, uh, they've been crowned uh, in, 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 you know, for, for the best team of the NBA. And those have been uh, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, and this guy named uh, Barry Brent, I believe. Um, and it's important to note that Outside of these three folks, and and probably Julius uh, Irving, um, uh, there there haven't you know the, the 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 people who tend to do really well in this contest are very very different from the folks who do well generally in the NBA league. Um, and so, w w the the when I started noticing this, I I thought there was a very interesting analogy here, where the NBA is sort of like your product career. It's it's a very long term thing. Um, but a slam dunk contest is sort of like interview skills, right? You, you have to train very specifically for that. Even if you're a very good uh, player, uh, what happens is, or a very good product manager, you still have to spend time to prepare and effectively sell yourself, make yourself desirable to the companies that you're talking to. Um, and, and, and those two things, you know, the same way that, that the NBA players uh, uh, who win championships are not generally very good at the slam dunk contests, um, the, you know, I've, I've seen that happen as well with product management. I've seen people who are phenomenal, you know, when they are, you know, in their career, but they just don't necessarily see the value in preparing for interviews because they think, you know, I'm so good at doing what I do that anybody's going to want to hire me. So they sometimes underestimate the effort required to actually sit down and prepare for interviews. Um, so after having coached over 50 people, I've spent hundreds of hours um, talking to people, you know, uh, understanding how they're approaching uh, companies. Uh, many of them share back the feedback that they get from the companies after they interview uh, with me. Uh, they all also often share with me the great news when they've actually been hired and accept an offer. Um, and so the, the thing that I've been able to distill is that it takes about 15 to 20 hours of a very serious commitment to get to your peak performance to be able to do really, really well at these interviews. So spending far more time than this, I think, is going to be is going to give you diminishing returns. And spending far less time on this means that there's probably going to be a few areas uh, here and there where uh, you can improve, you can do better, uh, and it may not be obvious to you. So how how do we split these hours up? I think there's there's primarily around six areas that you have to be actively thinking about and preparing for ahead of time. There are things that you cannot, you can never prepare for um, because questions can be very, very open-ended. I think when you follow this this sort of pattern of attacking specific areas, um, you know what happens is even if you get a very open-ended question in in one of the real interviews that you've never thought about, your brain has already started doing pattern matching and can help you kind of take up an entirely new concept, an entirely new question, take you know thirty seconds or a minute to think about it and then prepare an answer based on some of the things that you have been preparing so far. Um, so the first one is probably like frameworks. Um, many PM interviews are somewhat structured, not super, you know, not 100% fully, you know, rigid, but they have, they follow, they tend to, to follow a certain structure. Uh, and it turns out that there are good books out there to read about what kind of frameworks you can use to answer questions. Then an, another big thing is to prepare your own behavioral stories. These are, you know, five to six stories that 
uh, you think are 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 really memorable uh, that, you, that that display your personality, the way that you make decisions, your accomplishments, things that you have struggled with. Um, the next thing I, I also recommend is sitting down and doing in-depth product analysis of various products, and and oftentimes they they should cover a broad spectrum. Sometimes you want to attack problems or products that are free versus paid, some that you use frequently, like a social network, versus some that you use infrequently, like you know travel planning or buying a house or buying insurance. Right? Those are the kinds of things that you only do like once or twice a year, really. Um, and you want to analyze products that are purely software versus products that have a hardware component as well. Uh, and you want to have like a broad spectrum of, of products that you're analyzing and you're thinking through some of the frameworks that are explained in the books. Um, and, and therefore, when you go into an interview and they say, hey, tell me about your favorite product or tell me about a product that you would want to improve or tell me about a product that you would want to work on, then you have a number of, of options to think about. Um, on, on technical skills, there's there's a very big debate uh, in a number of companies of you know how technical sh PMs should be. Uh, I you know I, I'm a, I'm in the camp where the more technical you are, you know the more chances of success you have, uh, and so it is worth investing in your own technical skills. Um, certainly, having a minimum bar is is always very very useful so that you can easily build trust with your engineering team. Um, next one is uh, there's all kinds of analytical and estimation questions that will come up for product managers that uh, you know demonstrate the the ability of the person to do quick problem solving, uh, to play around with math, to you know display some intuition about how how big how important different problems are, and then finally you need to practice and you need to practice and there's there's various ways. So I I told you that. It takes 15 to 20 hours, roughly. And what I've what I've you know realized with with the the, with the candidates that I've coached that it takes about five or six hours to read one or these or, or both of these books. Um, they are probably both sort of the top sellers of how to prepare for product management interviews. I highly recommend both both of them. And and they they, they do this first job of introducing you to the structure and some of the frameworks that you need to keep in mind when you're answering questions in a in the next thing is you, you probably want to spend about two hours preparing these behavioral stories that I told you about. Um, so selecting them and going through a mental model of you know what happened, what did I do, you know what was the you know the ultimate outcome. Just being able to tell a story is is very very important. Um, the next one is preparing product analysis. This is one of the longest ones uh, in terms of preparation because, you again, you want to try to tackle six or seven products uh, that are sufficiently different from each other, that you have a good spectrum to, to be able to discuss in depth if, if they ask you for multiple products. And you know, it, it, I think it takes anywhere between 30 to 60 minutes to analyze a product in depth and think about who are the, you know, the segments of the users, what are their pain points, what are different feature ideas that you can come up with? How do you prioritize them? Um, what are the competitors? What kinds of metrics you would measure? You have to go through this some sort of structured uh, framework for you know, six or seven products. That's going to take you a good few hours. Oftentimes, writing it down is very, very helpful. Uh, the next thing is you know, spend about an hour and a half reviewing technical concepts, especially those that are pertinent and relevant to the company that you're talking to. Some companies are very big into uh, artificial intelligence. And so you may want to start reading about uh, neural networks and different machine learning approaches that exist nowadays. And you may want to start familiarizing yourself with TensorFlow or any other techniques and, and tool sets that are out there for AI. Uh, other companies, uh, they may be very much in sort of like transaction space. Think about something like Stripe, right? So you may want to start familiarizing yourself you know how do credit card gate main gate gateways work, right? Or payment gateways work, um, and and start thinking about like the high level systems. Um, there's also a very good document out there that has uh, are roughly around 40 computer science terms explained in layman's terms, uh, and I highly recommend every PM to kind of read through that through that document and familiarize themselves with the the the, the different uh, topics. And if, if you if you read about one and you've never heard about it before, it's it's very, very helpful to just go through Wikipedia 
understand the context, the history, where it's useful, how it, it is applied, and, and you start building some of your technical skills. Um, next one is that there's this famous uh, problem of how many golf balls can fit into a, into a school bus. Um, and so that's a, a very typical estimation question. Um, other kinds of estimation questions you may hear are things like how much, you know, how much storage does Google need to store all of Gmail, or how much, uh, you know, how much uh, bandwidth does uh, Facebook or Instagram need to uh, serve its customers on a daily basis? Right. All all these kinds of questions are are fascinating, and it does help to practice around you know three of those from the beginning to the end. That that's going to take you about half an hour. But the overall approach to these kinds of analytical questions is to start with a formula at the beginning or you know, break down the problem into pieces that you can actually identify and then go into each of them individually and, and explore. Uh, and then finally, I, I recommend doing practice of two to, you know, two to four hours of practice. And that can be with a product management coach. It could be with a peer. Um, it could be like effectively just starting to interview with companies and and sort of starting to get that level of practice. Sometimes I recommend just sitting in front of a computer and recording yourself uh, and then watching the recording afterwards. You'll be able to tell what kinds of things you're not doing very effectively, uh, how to communicate better, how to be more succinct. Uh, and that's just going to be generally very good practice for the real on-site interviews. Now, a few common pitfalls that I've seen so far. Um, I've, I've actually heard this <laughs> very, very, very often. I answer all the questions, so I think I did really well. Um, it happens really, really often. It's like I, I, I knew the answer to every question. I've heard that so much. Um, but the reality is that that's not enough. Um, it's not enough because things can go wrong. Uh, the first thing is it's all relative. Um, the, the an interview is not a test where if you score uh, you know 100 out of 100 or if you get a perfect score then you automatically get hired um, instead uh, more often than not the company that is hiring will look for the best candidate possible for that given role and so answering all questions correctly doesn't guarantee that you will get the role because someone else could have answered them all correctly as well but they can be you know more exciting than you are more passionate they can have you know, a more relevant background. They can have answered the same questions that you did, but faster or even with more details. Um, and so it's not about getting the right answer. It's about being able to explain yourself and, you know, demonstrate that you are the best possible candidate that they can find for that role. Uh, the next one is experience or background. Um, I'll share with you um, um, a real story about my myself. Um, uh, some time ago, I was uh, interviewing at Airbnb, and uh, they told me that the feedback was really, really good. Um, but they actually ended up going with a different candidate because that candidate was already working at Airbnb, and um, and that was a better fit for the role. So um, it's not that there was anything I did wrong in the interview, but rather that they found someone who had far more relevant experience and background that would have enabled them to be effective from day one because they already understood Airbnb culture and processes and, and trust. I still had a phenomenal time there uh, talking to the, to the various teams and, and thought they, they have an amazing company culture, um, but it just didn't work out, not because of something I personally did wrong, but rather because there was someone who was more experienced and had the right background to, to be able to, to be a good fit for the role. Then the, the other things that can go wrong, cultural fit, sometimes people, sometimes companies are looking for someone who's, you know, a quiet leader. Sometimes people are looking for an extrovert, you know, product visionary. Sometimes people are looking for someone who's driven by a consensus. Other times people look for like a dictator type, you know, very authoritarian type of figure because they need to, you know, get all the ducks in a row. Uh, different companies need different things at different times. Uh, on the communication front, it can happen that, again, you answer all the questions, uh, they're technically correct, but you fail to display a level of passion and emotion or, uh, or articulation that is necessary for the role. So even though you, know, you can answer you know, the, the, the questions correctly and give them you know, factually true uh, answers, it may still not be enough. 
And then finally, there's potentially subjective criteria, like did you build enough chemistry? Um, did you work for a competitor? Do you have, are you like in the right mood emotionally to be able to join uh, the team? Sometimes people will, uh, you know, will be turned off by your personality. Um, maybe you are too arrogant or you are too quiet and, and so it's not working out for the role. On the other hand, I've also heard people say, I bombed one of the interviews, so I'm certainly not going to get an offer. And you know, a week or two later, they hear back and it's good news. They've actually gotten the offer. And sometimes that happens because this is a hypothetical scenario that can happen. Um, if you look at the right, there's some guidelines of what scoring means. So 4.0 is, you know, this, this is a hypothetical uh, uh, scoring criteria. Some companies use it on a 4.0 uh, scale. Some people just use verbal, strong yes, strong no. Some companies use it on a 10-point scale. Doesn't matter, but for the you know for the purposes of this hypothetical scenario, imagine a 4.0 is something you give to someone who's exceptionally strong. You've never like very very at the top that you've that you've seen in your career, like top one percent type of thing. A 3.5 would be considered like a very strong yes. Like I really think we should hire this person. A 3.0 is like a weak yes. I think this person is good, but I'm not you know super in love with them. A 2.0 could be something like a weak no. And apologies for the typo there. Um, uh, a 1.5 could be like strong no, like I don't see this person uh, uh, working out here. And finally, like a 1.0 is the kind of score, it's like it's very controversial. It would be like I would quit if this person were hired. Um, and so we have candidate one, two, and three with these hypothetical scenarios. And again, sometimes this depends on the hiring manager or the hiring committee, but these are typical situations where something like this could happen. Uh, candidate one gets hired even if they have a 1.0, so they they really bombed an interview. Someone really actively hates them, <laughs> but the thing is, they managed to impress uh, two people very strongly, and a third and a fourth were you know strong supporters of this candidate as well. So basically, this may be like an individual cultural crash clash with one specific individual, but um, but but you know you still bombed an interview and you got the offer. In the example number two, candidate number two, technically they passed all the interviews. Uh, they they got a weak yes from everyone, meaning everyone is happy to to join to have this person join on board, but no one's a strong yes, and no one has you know no one is rating this candidate as sort of the top that they've ever seen. So uh, traditionally, a hiring committee or hiring candidate, uh, sorry, a, a hiring committee or hiring manager will see candidate number two and say. Why should we even bother if this person is not, you know, that exciting? And so they'll they'll be rejected. And then finally, candidate number three can have uh, three, you know, really, really, really strong votes, a couple of weak no's, and they can still get hired, right? So, so even if you don't do exceptionally well in all of them, you can still have a chance. But you, the the, the important part is that you have to impress at least one or two people very, very strongly. Um, in terms of resources, I want to very quickly highlight uh, Product Manager HQ. Uh, I think some of you are probably part of that already. It's it's probably the largest PM community in the world uh, with close to 6,000 6, members. It's a Slack um, group, and there's channels for all kinds of discussions, including interviews. Highly recommend joining it if you haven't done so yet. Uh, Productinterview.xyz uh, is a... Uh, a website that has some example questions, and then people can, it kind of acts like a wiki where people can sub submit their answers to. So you can get practice there by seeing, you know, seeing the question first, trying to come up with your own answer, and then compare notes with other answers from other people. The pminterview.com is a great resource to test yourself and time yourself how long it takes you to, to give some uh, good answers. Um, there's another, uh, there's a question bank that was created by a friend of mine called Mark Stefan, and uh, I created this uh, bit.ly link for it. It's a Google document. Uh, it's open to people, for people to collaborate, and it's, it's a question bank that covers questions that real people have gotten at Google, at Facebook, at Amazon, and oftentimes they include uh, answers as well that people are proposing as what well, could look very good. And the final link there um, is that, uh, is that uh, page that I was telling you about that has around 40 computer science terms explained, uh, and I think it's worth going through it. Uh, I'm, I'll be more than happy to share these slides uh, after I fix the typo uh, with uh, Piyush, and hopefully he can, you know, I guess, share them with the rest of the 
at the group afterwards. Uh, with, with that, I want to stop the presentation here, and I want to open it up for a and a Yes. Uh, we have missed one question. Zafar has asked during the session, what books would you recommend for framework? Uh, the, the 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 two that I mentioned were cracking the PM interview and and the code and conquer, um, so those two books are probably the, the the best sellers out there that are that are covering the whole process of what it means to uh, go from polishing your resume all the way up to getting uh, phone screens, going to on site interview, and finally landing the job and then what once you become a product manager or if it's the first time that you're being a product manager what does it mean and how do you improve uh, both of those books I would highly recommend they also have their own frameworks uh, let me move into the chat to see uh, okay uh, okay uh, De Debbie Santosh asks uh, what is one common trait that most of the interviewers look for in PM candidates uh, by the way, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and, and ask me the questions verbally. I, I'll be happy to interact with you as well that way. Um, and uh, so common traits, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you um, the, a story from, from my Yahoo days. I think uh, one of the things we did was we, we try to document and, and codify what were the skills that a product manager should have, and then we would look for those during the interviews. Uh, and, and we distilled it down to analytical skills, product sense and intuition. Uh, we looked at technical skills, we looked at communication, and we looked at uh, analytical um, analytical skills. So roughly five, five general traits. Um, to some extent, for more senior candidates, we would also look for uh, strategy and you know, long-term vision. Um, so depending on your seniority, that may or may not be a, an important factor. Uh, and, and what we observed at the time was that uh, the most successful PMs had to have like a minimum bar in all of these categories, but they also had to show very clear strength in, in at least one of them, um, meaning like they're, they're far better than average on at least one of those categories. And, and so I think in some level, uh, most recruiters or most companies are looking for someone who's, who's who can very who can be very very strong either at technical skills or very strong at product sense or very strong at analytical skills or very strong at communication or very strong at strategy, um, and so and that's that goes back to the scoring criteria, right? Like you you may do really 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 well in one or two of the interviews, and even if you don't do exceptionally well in the others, but you meet a minimum bar, then you, there's a chance that you're going to get an offer. And so I, I would say, make sure that you're spending, investing enough of your time, not just in knowing a little bit about everything, but knowing a lot and, and being very, very confident in one of your areas. You know, if you're not sure what you're naturally very good at, like you've, you've felt that you've, you know, try to navigate all of aspects of product management and you're not sure where you fit in the most, then uh, ask the people that work with you or the people that know you best you know how they would describe you to someone else and that should give you a hint of what they're starting to observe as, as sort of your natural traits um okay rohan says what is a good conversion ratio say three out of ten interviews um i don't know that there's a a a, a specific ratio that i would tell you to target um uh, because I think it varies a lot depending on which kinds of companies you're applying to, uh, how qualified you are. At the end of the day, you just need one good offer to be in, a, in great shape. So um, what I can tell you, though, in terms of a numbers game is that I do not recommend people applying to more than five or six companies in a period of time. But at any given point, you should only be focusing on your top five or six choices. So this notion of sending your resume to like 150 different companies, I think is actually a bad idea. Uh, I think it's far better to uh, pick a small set and say, I want to really focus on these five or six. If any of them give me a good offer, I'm joining. I'm going to be really, really excited. The reason for that is um, it's become kind of uh, kind of a trend in some companies to ask you to um, spend three to four hours putting together a presentation on a prompt that they give you. 
And so that's going to take you time. If you if you pick 20 companies, you do this, you multiply, you do the math, and you're going to be spending days and days and days doing this, and, and you're not going to get a great return for the investment. Um, the other thing is when you pick those five to six companies, it allows you enough time to start reading about their company culture, the products they have launched, the kinds of challenges that they're running into, what what kinds of problems the engineering team is tackling. And that provides a... a, a an ability or an opportunity for you to connect on a on a more uh, on a deeply or uh, on a deeper level when you actually go to to the interviews. So I would say um, shoot for five or six at the most. If you get turned down from like three or four of those, it's fine to you know now start looking for another two or three that you want to put in the group. But don't do simultaneously 15, 20 companies or even send your resume to 100. I think it's a I think it's just shooting yourself in the foot. Um, be more uh, you know, more more targeted, I would say. Um, Nando, um, yes, yeah. One quick question. Uh, in today's scenario, we we have like artificial intelligence or IoT, or mobile technologies. So many, so many products, and I feel like mobile might be there. A lot of product managers already in the market. So, do you feel like? If someone prepare their resume according like IoT or artificial intelligence would be a brighter chance to get a PM role if someone had that kind of experience on those products. Does it make sense? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, so the question is like whether you should be targeting your experience to find a role. Um, let me say a couple of of things. The first thing I would say is. Your resume accounts for a very, very small percentage of whether you get an offer or not. It's important as a first filter to kind of get you to the initial phone screens or to the in on-site interviews, but it's not the determinant factor. It's it's a small percentage. I would say probably like five percent, certainly under ten. Uh, so so really, where you need to stand out is in the interviews. That's what's going to give you the opportunity to impress the people you may be working with and land a job offer. So in terms of like, should you? The the, the thing is, it's very hard for you to say I'm going to become an expert in in AI or IoT or any other trend that's out there uh, in a very short period of time, just for the single purpose of passing a PM interview. Um, someone who's a genuine expert in those fields will be able to ask you detailed enough questions that they can expose that you're not really an expert yet, that you are starting to work on it. Um, so, so you shouldn't try to game the system. Like You shouldn't become an IoT expert or an AI expert or a VR expert you know, in a period of a week or two just because you want to tackle an interview. Uh, oh. Instead, I think you should be thinking about it more long term and say, like, what areas are, am I passionate about? Uh, I think there are still many companies out there that are looking for PM generalists. Mm -hmm. So um, you still need to be strong at one core area of your personality and your you sort of like the way that you make decisions and uh, and 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 sort of lead. But uh, that means you could be jumping from a consumer product to a B two B product. You could be jumping from someone that's very partner heavy to something that's very technical heavy. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of PMs have the ability to adapt to you know the environment and to what the uh, team needs, especially early on in their careers. So, I would say if you are already passionate about an area, uh, it is very useful to become a, a true expert, meaning like spend months and months on it uh, and try to read and do as much as you can in that area. But don't do it just for the sake of gaining an interview. Okay, so if 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 I if I would ask if I rephrase this, what would the easiest uh, field to learn? And uh, not field. That's not a uh, easier product, easier technology to learn uh, to get a PM role because uh, like I have been I've been at a technical for almost like ten years. I've been I've mm -hmm. done hard code coding and development and for like ten years. And now I feel like I want to move into product management. Mm -hmm. So mobile would be the easiest way to get that role because I don't want to learn like IoT or AI because it's new to me, it's alien. So let's let's think about mobile and it's easier to get a job. And there's a more probability because there are a lot of openings. So you you are in the market. What do you feel like there's a more opening of PMs in which uh, for the mobile or for? Okay, in my experience, in in my experience, and 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 again, some different companies. Do things differently, 
But in my experience, the majority of PM roles that people are hiring for, they don't expect you to be an expert in a field like IoT or AI. They expect you to be very strong technically, very strong analytically, very strong on a product sense level. They expect you to be good at communication. And they expect you to, once you join, to learn and become an expert. You have to show evidence that you're very good at picking up something new, that you're smart. So don't optimize. Again, I would say don't optimize for that. If you've been technical for 10 years um, and you want to get a PM role, what you should be ensuring is that you are good at at answering analytical questions? Can you break down complex abstract problems down into specific things that people can go and chase and tackle? Uh, I would think about, uh, you know, I would consider things like your product sense and intuition. Do you have an idea for how to think about what consumers and customers and users need? How to prioritize that? How to come up with ideas? Do you have some level of intuition for design, virtual and interaction? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have you know, good communication skills? Those are the kinds of things that I would be working on, which are like generalist skills that every PM would need. So these two books of Cracky PM interview and and Conquer would be enough for me to address all this uh, uh, like skill set that I can I can. They they will give you a very good foundation. I still think that you will need the fifteen to twenty hours of preparation to get to a really good state for the PM interviews. But yes, the books are a great starting point for sure. I don't so think they're sufficient though on their own. You still have to go. It's like, let's say you wanted to go and play tennis, right? You read a book that's written by Andre Agassi or Pete Sampras or, or, or you know, anyone, any yeah. of the great, you, you can't, they may tell you all the great theory about how to play tennis, how to grab the racket, how to run you know, from one side to another, how to serve, how to do all these things. But until you actually get on the court, you, mm. you can't, you know, you're, you're not playing tennis yet. So the books are great because they are written by experts in product management and coaching and interviewing, but they're not sufficient. You still have to do the practice yourself, kind of the analogy with tennis. So is there a way that first I have to like uh, spend like two or three hours uh, on uh, on daily basis, like three hours spend uh, daily for like a couple of weeks and then prepare yeah. your resume. And along the way, while doing your interviews, you also keep on, uh, you know, reading out the books and try to implement those stuff which you already have studied or. So, so I would say the, 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 the slides that I had about spending 15 to 20 hours, some of it reading the books, some of it preparing your behavioral questions, some of it analyzing products, some of it looking at analytical questions, uh, and some of it practicing, that applies very, very squarely to your situation. I also wrote a blog post. If you, if you go to Google and search for how to prepare for PM interviews, that's usually the, the top result. It's a Medium article. Or just search for how to prepare for PM interviews and then put my name on it, and you should be able to see it. Um, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there, there are a bunch of other questions in the yeah. chat, so let me try to go quickly through them so I, I have a chance to at least address everyone. Anyway, thank, um, you. thank you, Yaman. Uh, I think Vishal says resources to get basic understanding of APIs for PMs. Um, that's a good question. I, I don't, I wouldn't know how to point you to a specific resource off the top of my head. Um, but I would say, like, literally go to Google and search for, you know, good principles for building APIs. Um, if you also want to understand APIs, you have to write code yourself and have to play around with it. There's a lot of uh, APIs out there that are fascinating. Uh, and many of them have tutorials on how to get started. And I would say, put yourself, you know, create a challenge for yourself of, say, I'm going to use such and such API to build such and such, you know, solve such and such problem and then work on it and see you know what makes it easier what makes it hard to use the api what kinds of things you would want to see and then go online and read what you know different uh, i guess software architects you know say about how to build apis um, let me see the next question i think is abhishek uh, what sort of technical background should i have if i were to go for product management um, I'll reiterate, I think that you have a stronger chance of being successful as a PM the more technical you are. So to me, ideally, you know how to code and you 
you write code on a regular basis, not necessarily for production in the product that you work on, but maybe you work on building tools to automate some of your work, to analyze data. Maybe you work on uh, putting, you know, solving some problems by talking to different APIs um, that are disconnected from each other. Um, and so you, you, you maintain a certain level of technical fluency. Um, I think it's, I, I really like reading Hacker News, uh, so the Y Combinator um, sort of forum for submitting news. And there's a newsletter that they, that they have that they send once a, once a week on Fridays. And it, 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 talk, it, it, it puts together the best uh, links that they submitted and discussed in the last, last seven days. And usually there's two to three very interesting engineering articles, at the very least two to three every week, uh, that you should read and keep yourself up to date with you know, approaches to attacking different technical problems, to different solutions and techniques and you know, frameworks that are being launched out there to build uh, technology and, and just generally being aware of what's happening around you. And then spending a lot of time talking to your engineers and understanding you know, as, deeply, as deeply as you can what they're working on, what challenges they have. Um, let me see. I'm going to try to go super quickly on all of them because a lot of them are coming up, um, and 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 I want to make sure I want to be mindful of 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 everyone's time and the fact that you're all here. My question is around consult. This is Amit. Amit says uh, my question is around consulting for startups on the side. Is that a positive or negative? Developing product vision at 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 that earlier stage is it negative? Um, consulting for startups on the side. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Um, it depends on like how senior you are and like how much value you can actually bring to others. Um, if you're doing it for monetary reasons, I think that's usually wrong. You should be doing it because you actually enjoy it, and the startups that you are ad advising for are actually finding value in what you have to share. Um, in terms of developing product vision at an earlier stage, is it negative? Uh, no, not at all. Like that's precisely when you should be trying to articulate what you want to build and why. Um, and Abhishek says, "I'm currently to give you some context. I am currently associated with marketing. So when you when you said uh, when you asked about technical background, Abhishek, if you're currently in marketing, um, try to learn how to code as soon as possible. Um, you know, you can do it with for free online. There's a lot of tutorials out there." I personally recommend starting with something like Python, maybe Ruby, Ruby on Rails, um, because they are relatively easy from a syntax perspective. They'll allow you to do things very, very quickly. There's a lot of support out there in the developer community. Um, and they're object oriented, so that it's not just purely scripting. So they'll give you some, some good starting point. Uh, and start reading technical articles as much as you can. Again, I recommend Hacker News. Um, uh, Kushagra asks, you talked about product intuition as one of the parameters measured by the interviewee. Um, and uh, the, 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 the way that it's typically measured in an interview is they'll give you a brand new problem that you probably have never thought about because it's very specific to the company. And they'll see how you approach it, how you attack it. What are you, the first steps that you take? What do you propose? Um, they'll ask you for things like, you know, if, if you say, well, I would first do research and try to understand, you know, what percentage of users uh, show the following behavior. Uh, they may ask you, well, what do you think, you know, after you do the research, what do you think the numbers will look like? And so they start giving you a, a sense of, you know, whether you have the right intuition for talking about users and what are their pain points and, and how to build features that actually satisfy those, those pain points. Um, Debbie Santosh uh, asks, how much role pragmatic marketing certification plays in screening? Does it add value nowadays to a resume, or are they passe? Uh, I think, generally speaking, for the most part, certification uh, is not a very strong role in screening. Now, that is something, that's an observation I'm making for primarily tech companies in the Valley. Um, I, I, I think there's a, a people here represented from very different parts of the world. And I cannot say for sure how things are in different parts of the world. But I would say, you know, certifications, just check the, you know, the the job description and see if it's a if a strong requirement. But generally speaking, I don't think they are a good substitute for actual um, 
you know, being smart and having experience if, if you're relatively senior in your career. Otherwise, certificate, all certification does is they teach you about some, some concepts or some framework or some, you know, some structure, some process that people like to follow. Generally speaking, if you're smart, you're going to pick it up while you work anyway. So I don't think they're, they're strictly necessary. But again, I will, you know, I'm sure that there are different cultural norms in different countries. So, so I would check with someone senior wherever you live. Um, Sar Sarab asks, how do I switch from business analyst to product management profile? Um, business analysts tend to be really strong at analytical skills already. So um, I'm assuming that that's where your strength lies. So what you want to do is make sure that you get up to a minimum bar in the other areas that are important for PMs, uh, like product sense and intuition. Spend your time, your side, you know, on side projects like building a website or putting together a mobile app or building something for consumers, testing it out, seeing what consumers how they react to it. Uh, play a part, an active part in actually designing it. How does it visually look? How does it work? Um, what are the features that you want to add? Uh, then uh, the other thing is make sure that you're spending time on your technical skills as well. Um, just like I mentioned to another person who asked that's about technical skills, uh, start learning how to code and spend some time reading engineering articles. Um, those would be my first two steps. The, the other thing, Saurabh, is uh, get the books, get one of the books, Cracking the PM Interview, <laughs> Cracking the PM Interview or Decode and Conquer, and read through the sections and figure out Definitely areas where you feel you need the most work on, like the, the areas that feel most foreign to the kind of work that you do and, and the kinds of things that you have to spend some time on. Um, Suhas asks, how do we approach guesstimate questions? Do they still give importance to this? Um, surprisingly, uh, yeah, they do give importance to this. It doesn't. It, that doesn't mean that you are guaranteed to get a guesstimate question um, in, in an interview. Um, but the, the, the general approach for these kinds of things is that you start with a general formula. Um, so if I ask you something like, how many does Google make uh, every day when people search for lawyers? Uh, that's a, a great question to start with a formula of saying, well, the Google will make as much money as the number of searches every day that uh, people do on Google when, you know, when they search for lawyers times the average revenue that Google makes on such queries. And that average revenue can be broken down into the click-through rate times the cost per click. Um, and so you start with a formula like that, and then you can launch deeply into figuring out the different parts. You know, you're simplifying the problem into smaller things that are more, I guess, approachable. And you start to give your own justifications for each of those variables. And then by the end of it, you should have a precise number that you multiply together, and then you come up with a final formula. And sometimes the final number that you arrive at is going to sound really high, or it's going to sound really low. So you have, to, if if it if into you know if your intuition tells you that that number is too high or too low, you can start revisiting the intermediate factors by at the end of the question and say, hey, I think my overall answer is very very high. So let me look at which of my factors may be a little bit higher than, than reality. And then you start adjusting from there. Um, Suhas also asks, uh, for FANG companies, how important is a CES background? Um, uh, different ones have different requirements. Uh, for instance, I know fam uh, Facebook has famously removed technical uh, as, a, as, a, as an area that they directly uh, test during uh, PM interviews. So they're not looking for that anymore. They used to, but not anymore. Uh, Amazon uh, likes uh, and prefers people with MBAs and a strong business background. Companies like Google um, and probably Netflix, if that's the end there, um, they probably look for very, very strong um, technical background. So it varies a little bit. Um, Sue has also asks, what would be your top three tips to someone in their early 20s interested in, in, in product management. Um, become technical. Um, that would be number one. Uh, and, and invest in that in, uh, over the long term. It's not like I'm going to spend three weeks becoming technical and that's it, but rather it's an ongoing effort. Um, and uh, so that would be number one. Number two is 
start being a PM. Uh, you don't have to wait until someone gives you the title. You can start being a PM either if you're already working at your current company or if you're in college, you can uh, you know, build a small startup or a side project or a class project where you're acting like the PM. Um, and the third, uh, third tip, I would say probably find a mentor that you can uh, talk to uh, ideally in person like once every month or every couple of months. Uh, someone you respect, someone that's relatively senior that uh, is willing to offer you their time to to start you know guiding you through your career. Um, Zafar says, at what age do you think PMs are at their peak? For example, tennis pros in twenties. Uh, I don't think that there are. I haven't seen a peak. Uh, honestly, I've seen some PMs that are very, you know. Age-wise, they're relatively old um, for like the average age. Um, I, I honestly, uh, I, I don't think that they're. I haven't seen a peak that I can describe that I can say. You know, after such age, you know, people are are not very good. Um, and partially, this is because, you know, for for tennis or for sports, you rely on your your physical body capabilities and your your you know your abilities, and those tend to peak at the most when you're in your late 20s or early 30s. Um, but for product management, you need your brain. So as long as your brain is continuing to function correctly, you're probably going to be OK. Um, Manish asks, any tips, references for creating good PM resumes, especially for experienced folks? Uh, I'll tell you one specific tip that I give everyone that may sound kind of obvious and trivial, but still it's surprising the number of people who don't follow it. Um, the, the general rule of thumb is don't have a single bullet in there that you think more than 10 people in the world have it in their resumes as well. What I mean by that is uh, a lot. you see a lot of resumes there saying, I work with the engineering team. Uh, I put together the roadmap. I uh, work with the design team to come up with the mocks. It's like, uh, yeah, that's precisely the definition of a product manager role. So you're not telling me anything new. Like you're not really telling me who you are. You're just telling me you you performed your function. I prefer bullets that say something like, "I launched my product in five, you know, within five different countries and attained uh, sustained daily active user growth of, you know, twenty percent year over year," um, or I shipped the following features for this product, um, feature A, feature B, feature C. Or, um, you know, we, you know, I, I, got, I, I hired X number of people um, for my team and uh, shipped the product within two months. So something, your bullet points in your, your resume should be unique to you. They should highlight why you're different than everyone else. Um, and, and generally speaking, that means insert numbers, insert quantifiable achievements that you can put in there and showcase why you're different from everyone else. Uh, Sapnik, with respect to technical questions asked in an interview, is it based on specific technology, or do they check for capabilities to build abstract pseudocode logic flow? Um, for the, so the vast majority of cases, as a PM, you're not going to be asked to write code. Um, pseudocode, someone may ask you to build it or to write it, but it's still even rare. Um, the, 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 the objective of, of technical uh, components of your, of your interviews is to make sure that you, are, that you understand systems at a high level, that you can effectively talk to an engineering team and understand what are their bottlenecks and how to <laughs> help them out, uh, how to understand the fact that code that gets written usually has bugs, and sometimes you have to spend time fixing those bugs or paying back technical debt. Um, it's to make sure that you understand trade-offs when, you when you're building a feature and you want it to do this great thing, and suddenly your engineering team tells you, if, if, you, want it to, if you want it like that, it's going to take us six months. But if you want to do a slightly different thing, then it may only take us one week to implement. Then you understand why those trade-offs need, need to happen. So that's kind of like the level of technical ability you should showcase. Um, 
but that said, it's still good to you know write code in your own time because it 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 exposes you to the kinds of problems that your engineering team faces on a daily basis. Um, Amon says companies nowadays ask you a write up um, uh, why you want to join. Uh, how can I prepare for the same? Um, I don't know if you're talking about a cover letter or you're talking about an actual essay that they actually that they ask you to write. Um, it is regarding uh, before any screening or any interview call. Generally, uh, a recruiter asked me to write a writer for a company. Suppose I'm, I was about to give an interview for a company, New York is conductor, mm -hmm. and they asked me to write a writer. Why you want to join? How you can be? Uh, you know, uh, play a role, constructive role in that company or something. I mean, so I don't know what kind of structure they are expecting me, or what kind of writer, or is there any. And it has happened like not once, like four or five times. To me, so I was just thinking, okay. prepare for the same. So, so I personally haven't seen very many of these, but I can tell you what my what my sense is of why they why they ask this and what they're looking for and how to structure your answers. They're probably doing this to start filtering out those kinds of people I told you about before that are applying to 100 companies at once that don't have the time to write 100 times of, of this thing. Uh, or they will, but it will, it'll sound very generic. So, so, so what they're looking for is, why do you genuinely want to join this company? Like, have you done your research? Do you understand what kinds of products the company works on? Who are the customers? What kinds of challenges they, they run into? What kind of recent product announcements are there? Uh, are there recent uh, controversies with the company? Um, what kinds of uh, technology solutions do they work on? Their tech stack. What kinds of people do they have? So uh, you have to do a. You have to spend probably a good half an hour or an hour at least researching what the company is. I mean, assuming it's not super, uh, uh, you know, assuming it's not super well known. Um, but the the kinds of I would say correct answers to a question like this can involve either a specific person or set of people that you want to work with and just mention why, right? Like what you want to learn from them. It can be because you personally are a passionate user of the product or of the company that you are applying to, and therefore you are excited about helping them grow. So that could be a good reason to join them. Another reason could be like you are excited about a particular technology trend. So if you are very excited about artificial intelligence, you may want to join Google. If you're very interested about e-commerce, you may want to, or, or about, uh, distributed systems and and building startups on 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 the cloud, then you may be interested in joining Amazon, right? So like you must demonstrate that there's something particular about the company that is in your field of interest uh, and as as the main reason why you want to join them. And I think you're just writing you know like two or three paragraphs, you know, and showcasing that you have done your research is probably a you know good enough to to pass that filter. So are they also looking for some kind of, like, do I give them a suggestion that this is the way we can improve or this kind of problem you are facing or su such kind of things are they looking for? They just, I have to just appreciate their products or something. You mean like specifically provide feedback of something that you want to fix if you work there? Yeah, something like this or it I, just- I think that's a risky move. Um, it could work, um, but I would I would save that information for when you do the on-site interviews. And even then, I would say, hey, I think you should fix that. I, I wouldn't say it like that. I would say, hey, I noticed that such feature is missing. I'm wondering if you could share how you you know how your company thinks about potentially building a feature like that, or why it hasn't been built, or why does it work this way and not this other way that I think would be better. Right, and so it shows that you have been thinking about the problems that you're passionate, but you're also respectful and don't think that you know it all. Right, right. Um, it sometimes that can come off as arrogant, as sort of like, hey, you know, yeah, you the idea that you're proposing, we already know about it, and you are oversimplifying the constraints, and therefore don't have a good understanding of why we haven't built it that way or why we haven't uh, fixed it. So you have oh. to be, you have to demonstrate a certain you know, certain level of humility when you point these things out and be more inquisitive and say, like, you know, try to understand 
why they would or would not work on fixing something like that. Uh, hi, hi, Fernando. Uh, we hope you can hear me. Yes. Uh, so, how long do, uh, do we need to stay at a particular company in a product management role so that I mean uh, it it does impact and uh, it has a strong impact on the resume? Because, for example, I've stayed in a couple of companies. Once uh, one company for six months as a PM and the other for a year and a half, and uh, people are seeing it as a red flag in terms of I'm not staying at companies for a longer time. And yep. both of the reasons were basically restructuring and something I didn't leave them out of my own will. I mean, so it was basically. Uh, closing of business units itself. Uh, so, how do you see in terms of uh, uh, covering for these, or say explaining these, or probably uh, how long do we, should we look for in terms of staying at a particular company in a product management role? That's a great question. Um, generally speaking, if you have short stints, like the ones you described, anything under two years, I would consider short. Um, if you have short stints, you better have a very good reason to back them up, um, like you're saying, right? Um, business units were restructuring, uh, you got laid off. That's a, a, a fine explanation that should be accepted. Now, if you have too many of these, that's still problematic. So yeah. I, would, I would highly recommend trying to go to a company that is more stable, something that you, you know, a company that you believe has no chance of laying off people in three years or so. Um, and 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 then if you have you know if you start having roles where you spent three years four years five years uh, that's that's kind of like the good sweet spot I would say of where you want to be if you have too many one year one and a half year six month roles lined up in your resume it's very hard to convince a company to give you a shot. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that. You're welcome, and best of luck. And I know it's tough when when these restructurings happening happen and, and they're not directly your fault. Um, make sure you you have an opportunity to explain that though at some point. If they're not asking for it, make sure you bring it up at some point explicitly because it's it's only going to hurt you if they don't know the reasons. Sure. Um, Suhas has, has an, another question. Um, he he's he thanks me so thank you so much as well. Um, best way to network with current PMs or get noticed other than LinkedIn. Um, I would say uh, try to join something like PM HQ, Product Manager HQ. I think that has a good network of people. Um, and you can find people who are geographically close to you or who are working in the same space or uh, as you or are interested in the same kinds of questions like about interviews or about tools for PMs or about processes or about other kinds of things. So that would be a good idea. Um, other than that and, and getting noti noticed other than LinkedIn, I think the way to get noticed is not to try to game the system, but rather to like become really, really good at what you do. So spend the time becoming a better PM, uh, a better, you know, someone who thinks about analytical problems more deeply, someone who builds software, someone who understands what customers need, someone who looks at data and can break it down. Uh, invest in yourself for the long term and you know, if you if you expose yourself enough within your own company or within different cir circles, you will get noticed. Um, I think the last question is from Aman that says, "Is solution architect role close to product management role?" Um, generally speaking, I don't think so. It doesn't mean that they don't share common areas. They certainly do. Uh, they are in some ways leadership roles. Uh, and sometimes, depending on how the company is structured, uh, they may both be those those kinds of leadership roles where you you don't have any direct reports, but rather you have to kind of lead, and and people will follow you because you gain their trust. Um, so, um, but other than that, I think the solution architect role uh, is is far far more concerned about the technical constraints of things, um, and and generally getting very deep in the weeds of the engineering uh, and the systems design of, of, of a solution, whereas a product manager has to have less of an in-depth focus on those engineering aspects, but have a more uh, clear understanding of the, the business needs, the product requirements, who are the users or the customers, what do they need, what are their pain points, who are your competitors. You have to be, I think, a little bit more aware of different aspects 
um, that apply to your product um, as opposed to be like super, super focused on the technical aspects alone. Got it. Yeah, uh, thanks, Fernando. And one, one more quick question. For a technical candidates, uh, is it easy to become a technical product manager, then product manager, so that they, they came in the product management line first, and then it is easy to, to switch to a product manager role from technical product manager? What's, what's your take on this? I think it really That's depends definitely. on the person. Uh, I think it, it greatly depends on whether you are ready on having a minimum bar of analytical skills and product sense and intuition and leadership style and strategic thinking and communication style. Some people may need that intermediate transition step. Um, some other people may want to just skip directly. And I think it depends on a case by case basis, like how much effort have you put into building those auxiliary skills that a PM needs uh, over your career. It's, it's it's not a bad idea to use the intermediate step, but I, I think some people could actually skip it, and I've seen people skip it. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think I've gone through all the questions in the chat, but um, I'm more than happy to stay an extra couple of minutes if people have any final thoughts or questions. Yeah, and some I felt nowadays e-commerce, uh, product on e-commerce are, uh, are more in demand compared to uh, others like technical products is it the case of payment or uh, there are so many products now in the market like is the e -commerce more sought after kind of it is a question whether e-commerce is the most sought after category right now yes i mean that's what i have felt over the period of time like most of the companies they are they're they are asking you have an e-commerce experience actually i got opportunity to work with the walmart labs in san mm -hmm. bruno so I got that experience and then I realized because I was on a contracting job and now they are, they ask me specific about the e-commerce and but my e-commerce experience is only specific to only you know on the payment and I was on a more on a API sites. Yeah. I feel like I have to prepare myself only in e-commerce and is there any good books or how to do this or like uh, I think there are mm, other areas for sure that are, are very exciting right now that are not just e-commerce. Um, so there's the whole virtual reality and augmented wave. There's the internet of things. There's artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, there are B2B companies. So lots of B2B companies that are effectively rely on a sales force to get the, you know, to get companies to buy their products. Um, and so they have different challenges. I would say there, there's still, there's of course the whole cryptocurrency and blockchain enabling okay. technology. So I think it's a little bit more broad than e-commerce. If you're Thank seeing you. too much focus, it may be because your background is very relevant to those kinds of companies and focusing a lot on that. But I would say if you, if, if you're not sure or convinced about e-commerce long term, you're probably still at a really good time to start exploring some of these other areas. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Fernando. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. OK, well, I want to thank you, everyone, as well. Actually, Sati has one more question. Would you would like your opinion on whether a PM job is domain specific or the skills are domain agnostic? Um, I think it's a combination of both. Um, I think there are skill sets from a PM perspective that apply reasonably well to different contexts and different teams and different areas and different domains. Um, and those relate to how technical you are. How can you break down a, a problem and be very analytical? How can you define the metrics to track? And how do you align the team to go and, and, and tackle those metrics? How do you, uh, you know, how do you prioritize the feature set that you want to do? How do you communicate that stuff to your engineering team and to the rest of the company? How do you handle meetings? How do you set up agendas? How, how organized you are with documentation? A lot of those are very common traits that every PM has to have now. A PM uh, working specifically on a social network needs to understand kind of like the, the psychology and the incentives that get humans going and that get them to do things like share photos and status messages about their life versus someone who is working, let's say, on a on building a, a cell phone, a mobile phone, they need to understand, you know, how the hardware pieces 
fit together and how the, the, the hardware design is, is, you know, has some, I guess, constraints for the, the components that go inside of the phone and how to negotiate with different manufacturers and how to assemble it and, and all kinds of things and how to do testing on that front is very, very different from doing testing on a social network. So there's certainly some skills that are specific to the domain. Um, so it's a combination of both. Okay. Uh, okay, Sati has a, a follow-up. How can I prepare for interviews uh, when the opening is for a completely different domain? Um, you, you, you should do a couple of things. One is um, start reading about that new domain as much as you can. Go on, you know, go to Google, search for blogs and articles and Quora discussions, Reddit forums, whatever that discuss what's happening in that domain so that you start getting familiarized with the terminology, with the kind of challenges that they have, with, with what kinds of solutions to problems are already well known and understood. Like start familiarizing yourself with the lingo, with the people, with the techniques, with everything you can. Like try to become, you know, have a, a general good sense. And the other thing is start thinking about how you can pitch your existing experience as being valuable to that new domain, right? You can say, hey, I've learned uh, lessons by doing X, and it turns out that in your domain, um, I'm realizing you're starting to face some of these problems, and with my experience, I can help you kind of attack those problems more effectively. Something along those ways, uh, uh, along those lines. Uh, hopefully not sounding arrogant or that you know it all, but more like you are willing to learn about something new and you're willing to invest and that you think your experience may be valuable in making decisions or solving some of the problems they face. Um, okay, um, um, Sati, uh, thank you as well. I'm, I'm glad the, the suggestions were practical and useful. Um, Piyush and everyone else, thank you so much for hosting me. Uh, again, I will fix up the typo that I found on the slides and I will send uh, you guys a PDF version of this. Uh, my, I will also, um, you know, when I send this to Piyush over email, I'm happy that he forwards this to all of you, and, and you also have access to my email address. I'm more than happy to stay in touch that way. Um, and best of luck in your uh, product careers. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Fernando, for joining and sharing our experience with us. The session was really helpful, and I hope every one of us have got answers to all our queries. And in case you have any queries, you can reach out to Fernando. Uh, can you share your mail ID in the chat section? Yeah, I will. Um, and uh, because I will send you the slides I just did, um, and because I just shared with you this, uh, I'll share with you the slides page in a second. You can then forward that to the group um, yeah. if you have a way if you have a way to easily do that. And then they'll they'll have a sense they'll have a chance to see my email address as well if, if they weren't able to make it or if they already left the session. Yes, yes, sure. I'll share it with them. And before okay. ending ending the session, I would like to give you a brief about pragmatic leaders as well. We are building this with a motive to bring product management discourse to the forefront. And we have designed an entire online product management course where along with the live sessions, you will build and ship a real product with our in-house team, in-house development team. And mm -hmm. I'm sharing the link for our website in the chat section. You can check it out here. And we have very interesting sessions lined up also. So you can register for them by visiting our website. Awesome. Thanks a lot, awesome. Fernando. One Thank you so much uh, for hosting me. Um, I imagine it's late for some of the people who are here. So have a good night if you're in that part of the world. And have a great rest of the day if you're somewhere uh, closer to uh, this side of the world. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.